what it said on there. Let's go. Good morning. Welcome to Richland Center Free Methodist Church. And if you're watching us online, we welcome you as well and would welcome you to the services here in person at 1030 every Sunday morning. Um, let me go through some announcements real quick. Uh, wow, that's really cool, the way you arrange that. Man, that's pretty awesome. Um, man, he's just really good. I can give him anything and he'll just run with it. Digger's Bible study Thursday mornings at 930 in the church library. And then, I guess I better turn this on. And then um, Saturday afternoons at 3 o'clock, we have our prayer time here in the sanctuary. We say in the church library, but we've been trying to meet here as much as possible. Remember to keep up on our prayer walking through the city and through the county. Um, you don't have to walk all of the highways in the county. That's fine. You can just drive to places and do that. We want to pray for our neighbors and, uh, and the business people and, and all of that. So uh, there will be a very brief board of administration meeting right after service this morning. It's just going to be just a little bit of informational uh, uh, transfer um, right after the service. And after that, um, if you haven't got anything else to do today, which I know some of you do, um, make a quick trip out to the county fair. Um, Anna and Andrew Cornell have been showing their their cows and I don't know, do they have sheep? No, just, just dairy. And uh, they will be cleaning everything up and going home about three or four this afternoon, but just a, a shout out to them. What I heard from Heather last night when I talked to her is they cleaned up on the dairy division. So Anna and Andrew pretty much won everything took top cow and I think Anna had a grand champion right okay. yep so um, oh yeah yeah I don't have a clue what golden gallon is but that's okay I'll find out when I go talk to him but anyway um, so uh, so if you get a chance go out there and just congratulate them and uh, have fun walking through the through the cattle sheds and, uh, and all of that Junior Dairy Barn. Okay. Um, anyway, so that's this afternoon. This evening is the beginning of GLOW, and it's going to be at the Christian Skate Night at Galaxy Skate Center from 4.30 to 7.30. So kids, uh, this is a kid's time, but it's not just for kids. Even Jeremiah can go. And, and so um, we'll have the beginning of uh, GLOW tonight in conjunction with Christian Skate Night. And pizza and pop for our church people that are there, um, provided by the church. Next weekend is Sportsman's Retreat down in Birmingham, Iowa. If you want to register for that, it's Friday night, the 15th through Sunday lunch, uh, the 17th, and that's in Birmingham, Iowa. You can go on a Facebook page, uh, go on to Heartland Christian Camp, Birmingham, Iowa, and you'll find it. There'll be a registration for it. The cost for the whole weekend is $75. That includes your, your food and your lodging and everything. Um, so you can go on there and register if you want to make it down there. Um, so you can be there for that. Um, potluck dinner on the 24th. In your bulletin, it says the 17th. It's going to be the 14th. Or excuse me, 24th. 24th, okay? So not next weekend, but the following following weekend. Uh, on Sunday, the 24th, will be potluck. And along that same line, we have a bunch of eight-foot wooden tables, folding tables, that we are getting rid of. So if you would like an eight-foot wooden folding table, um, for anything other than a boat anchor, you may see me or just go down and grab one out of the furnace room. Uh, they're down in the furnace room. You can, you can grab one of those. I think we have like 10 that we're going to give away. So uh, see me about those or anybody else on the board. Um, Christian might load it up for you. But anyway, um, might. Um, so... <laughs> Uh, then also, let's see, fall colors trip October 7th. 
We are going to be going on a trip around through the country. Hopefully, we have had enough rain that actually have some colors other than brown. But we will see October 7th. You know, the most fun about it is, is just being with everybody. And then we'll have lunch at one of the restaurants in Reedstown. Um, we haven't decided exactly where, but one of those restaurants in Reedstown. Uh, that will we'll be leaving here from the church at 9 o'clock uh, and then getting back around 2. Um, so that's, that's that. Uh, then one announcement about prayer, and there's several announcements about prayer um, that we will be posting on a, a prayer sheet, but one we need to be aware of, and I won't give you a lot of information because I can't, but Sandy's, Sandy Siddick's grandson is in urgent critical health need right now, and just we really need to be praying for him. Um, so if you, would, if you would be doing that, he's in the hospital right now and it's just very urgent. So um, if you would keep Lance in your, in your prayers, um, and that's kind of what we're doing. So with that, let me read some scripture and then we will pray before the worship team comes up. Psalm 103, praise the Lord my soul, all my inmost being, praise his holy name, praise the Lord my soul and forget not all his benefits who forgives all your sins and heals all your diseases, who redeems your life from the pit and crowns you with love and compassion, who satisfies your desires with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. The Lord works righteousness and justice for all the oppressed. Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come to this place to worship together, to worship you and only you. We thank you, Father, that you are the one true God, and, and we have chosen to be your kids. You have chosen us as well. You have ad adopted us through the blood of your Son, and we thank you for that. Father, we ask even as we begin that you would be with Lance and the others that are on our prayer list. Um, we ask that you would uh, bring healing to bodies that need to be healed. Uh, we ask, we thank you for healings that have taken place and good things that have already happened. Um, but we ask that you would continue to do that. Father, we ask you also that you would heal us in spirit and, health and emotions as well. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Good morning, everybody, <clears throat> and welcome to our service. You know, it's that time of year where, you know, it starts getting a little bit colder in the evenings, you know, and, you know, the leaves start looking a little funky. Um, so my... Bible scripture this morning said, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. Um, that's Philippians 4, 6. My request is I don't have enough time to get all the things done before winter comes. Um, if anybody needs any tomatoes, I have tomatoes. <laughs> if you would stand with us, please. Um, one of the things, two pastors, I wanted to remind everybody, if you're interested in going to Sky Lodge for women's retreat, Mm. Um, I have a copy of the brochure that they sent out. If anybody's interested, um, see me. What weekend. weekend is that? It is, I'm sorry, September 22nd through the 24th. And so you would be going up, you could stay in their, their lodging that they have there, which would be a very comfortable bunk bed, you know, <laughs> with, a, with a cushion that's about this deep. And, and it's a great time, <laughs> but it is, it's good to spend time. If you're interested, please let me know. Um, and roller skating. Y'all got to come roller skating tonight. Yeah, 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 everybody? <laughs> it should be fun. <clears throat> We're going to try a song we haven't done in a long time, and it's a little tricky without drums, but I love <coughs> the title, I love the words, so just let's proclaim this together. Two. Be now. 
Lord, we just proclaim that freedom in all that you have done and given to us and, and all the wonderful things that you have planned for us, Lord. As we go into our next song, would you just humble us and, and bring us into that wonderful feeling, that wonderful realization of your love. Savior, isn't he wonderful? As we sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. This next song is God is in the story. And we've done it a couple times recently. And I just want you to really let that last song resonate into this song. Lay down what you think your story needs to be. And I know that I'm speaking directly to myself. <laughs> 
So sing this with me. This torn up pages in this book, words that tell me I'm no good, chapters that define me for so long. But the hands of grace and endless love dusted off and picked me up, told my Your, your knowledge far above ours. Lord, you are the Alpha, the Omega, and we praise you for this moment of music and worship, and we pray that it goes through the week. In your powerful name, amen. You may be seated. As when, the, when the worship team comes down off the stage, kids, you can come on up for kids' time. No, we're not going to do the chicken walk. Oh, yeah. Another one of the prayer requests that we can mention is Jason Marsh, who is the son of our former pastor, Greg Marsh. Jason is also a pastor in Michigan. He's going to be having surgery tomorrow morning, and so be praying for him and for the family as well. Um, so... Yeah, if you would do that. Um, we have a prayer chain that we send out these, these messages by email. So if you would like to be on that.
that prayer chain and received messages of when we need to be praying for certain things, would you see Maureen? Stand up, Maureen. Maureen will put you on our list so we can send that information to you when we have um, prayer needs and stuff. All right, kids. Wow, this is cool. I love so many kids. I'm, but I'm still glad I only had two. Well, actually, I didn't. My wife did. You know, that's kind of how that works. So what do we do today at the end of the service? Communion. Communion, okay. Do you know what the other names for communion are? Communion. communion. <laughs> do you know any other names for communion? Chase? The Lord's, the Lord's, Body. supper, the Lord's supper is one. What's another one? Do you guys know another one? Lord's Some, Lord's breakfast. No, probably that was fish by the side of the lake. Anyway, um, some people, some churches call it Eucharist, which is a really interesting name. It's E-U-C-H-A-R-I-S-T. Comes from a Greek word that means thanksgiving. And so when we take communion, which we're doing this as one body, communion means with union. We're doing the Lord's Supper, taking the Lord's Supper, but we're also thanksgiving. I just faded out a minute. Okay, well, actually the mic faded out. Um, but anyway, so, so we, we do that once a month here. And um, why do we do it? Okay, yeah, it reminds us of when Jesus gave the supper to his, his apostles. That's why we call it the Lord's Supper. Do you know why it's called the Lord's Supper? Because the Lord gave the supper. Okay, do you know when they did that? Curtis. Okay, it was at that supper that he identified who was going to betray him. Okay, um, but what else? Do you know what time of year that is for the Hebrews? That it, Jace, do you know what kind? There was a time, there was a set season that the Israelites called the pass. The pass. Over the Passover, and the Passover was something that happened, and we're going to be looking at it in our in our study in Exodus. The Passover was something that happened when the Israelites were in Egypt, and they. When they got ready to go out, God had sent all these plagues on the Egyptians. And the last one is the firstborn males of every family other than the Israelites died. And so the Israelites put blood on their doors to show the angel of death that they were safe. And so the angel of death passed over them and didn't harm anybody in the Israel. Israeli houses. So that's why they call it Passover. Jesus was celebrating this with his disciples, uh, this meal with his disciples before he was crucified. On the night before he was crucified, it was actually the night when he was arrested. But they were celebrating that Passover meal, and that's where the Lord's Supper starts from. Um, the Passover, during the Passover, they would sacrifice a lamb and sprinkle the blood on the doors to show that it's a covering for their sin. Jesus was known as the Lamb of God. Have you heard that before? And so he was, he was crucified so that God would overlook our sin for us. And so he became that sacrificial lamb. So we celebrate the Lord's Supper. We celebrate the communion. What do we have in communion? Bread and grape juice. Is that what you were going to say, Jays? Okay, bread and grape juice. Do you know what they signify? What? You know? We can dance. Yes, that's what they signify. That's awesome. <laughs> Very good. The bread signifies Jesus' body, and the juice signifies Jesus' blood. So Jesus was crucified. And, is, and we say in the communion, we say, 
his body was broken for us and then his blood was spilt for us. Yes. Yeah, actually, they did drink wine. Do you know what the grape said when the elephant stepped on it? Nothing. It just let out a little wine. <laughs> but um, boom. Anyway, um, so so that's what we're going to be doing later. That's the significance of what we do with the Lord's Supper and communion. We want to remember and give thanks for the fact that Jesus became the Lamb of God that sat, was sacrificed for us to give us forgiveness from our sin and to transform us into a new life. So when you ask Jesus into your heart, when you ask Jesus to become your Savior and your Lord, that means you're asking him to direct your life and you're thanking him for forgiving you, for giving his life for you. And we do that every time we have communion as we give thanks for that. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for this time. Thank you for these kids and, and uh, the lessons that they learn and we learn as well. Father, we ask that even as we continue in this service, as we get to the time of the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist, the Thanksgiving, that uh, you would help us to be most thankful for the fact that you... Uh, gave up yourself for us that we might be forgiven and that might we might become children of God. In Jesus' name, amen. Or do you want me to lead it? Or? I can take care of it. Okay. Yeah, I've got a plan. All right. It's never too soon to start leading hymns, right? So we're going to do this together. You good? Okay, um, so this morning, Beth was not able to be with us, so uh, Liz, is, Liz is going to help, and uh, if you would stand with me, we're going to sing. We're not going to sing uh, Surely Goodness and Mercy. You know, it's got some funky little sharps and stuff in there. So we're going to sing page 43, which is Great is Thy Faithfulness which is a really, really great song. So as we're singing this, um, really sing out everybody, please.
are so blessed. You may be seated. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you again for this time of worship, this time when we can join our voices together and our hearts together in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, Megan is going to be reading from Exodus chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. So if you want to follow along in your Bible, you may do so. Exodus 2, 1 through 10. Right. Now a man of the tribe of Levi married a Levite woman, and she became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. But when she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and coated it with tar and pitch. Then she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the bank of the Nile. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. Then Pharaoh's daughter went down to the Nile to bathe, and her attendants were walking along the river bank. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her female slave to get it. She opened it and saw the baby. He was crying, and she felt sorry for him. This is one of the Hebrew babies, she said. Then his sister asked Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get one of the Hebrew women to nurse the baby for you? Yes, go, she answered. So the girl went and got the baby's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this baby and nurse him for me and I will pay you. So the woman took the baby and nursed him. When the child grew older, she took him to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son. She named him Moses saying, I drew him out of the water. So do you know who the two greatest financiers in the Bible were? Testing. The greatest male financier was Noah. While everybody else was underwater, he was floating his stock. <laughs> and the greatest female finance here in the Bible was the Pharaoh's daughter because she went down to bank, the bank of the Nile and withdrew a profit. Anyway, um, so that's what you paid me for. You remember that we've been going through the Old Testament to grasp the faith lessons that we can learn from our patriarchs of the faith. We have finished the book of Genesis and have begun the book of Exodus. As we left our study in the book of Genesis, we, looked, we talked about the faith of Joseph, how he remained focused on the Lord and the dreams he received, even in the face of great hardship. And looking back, we can see how God blessed Joseph by letting him become the second most powerful man in the world so that he could save the Israelites from starvation. Through the encounter of his brothers coming to buy grain from him, Joseph was reunited with his family, and they moved to Egypt to be with them. And while the Pharaoh was still alive, the Egyptians, or excuse me, the Israelites were treated as royal guests, and they multiplied in exceeding numbers. But a change in Pharaohs came about, and it brought a change in the political climate, much like that of electing a new president here in America. And with those changes, the Israelites went from being treated as royal guests to becoming slaves at the hands of their harsh slave masters. And they were kept as slaves in their miserable conditions for just over 400 years. Now, it wasn't the same ones, obviously, because it was multiple generations that went on. But today we continue our journey through the book of Exodus and we'll see how God entered into the daily lives of his people and walked with them daily, giving them step-by-step -step instructions on what to do next. 
He not only led them out of captivity, but he did it in such a way as to prove that the Egyptians, Egyptian gods were nothing when compared to the true God. In fact, as I've told you before, throughout this book and throughout the Old Testament, in many places, even in the New Testament, one of the phrases that God uses quite often is, so that they will know that I am God. And when he spoke to Moses, Moses asked him who you are, and we'll see that a little bit later, he gave the name I am. And so we look at this and we see that God is declaring that he is God over all. The word exodus means to exit from or to depart from. And as we read this book, we will see how God rescued the Hebrew nation from their captors. And we see how he rescued Moses from certain death several times. And woven into this entire story, we will see somehow how God in his infinite love continued to show great mercy for us even though we continue to sin against him. This story in Exodus is a little microcosm of the salvation story when Jesus was sent. Moses was the deliverer for the Egyptian, or excuse me, Israelite people. Jesus was the deliverer for all mankind. Our nature is to complain loudly and often about the situations we find ourselves in. But even while we are busy complaining, we choose to do nothing to get out of those situations. Why is that? We do that because no matter how much we may hate where we are, something that is known to us is always more comfortable than something that is unknown. We fear the future because we don't know what it's going to be. We can have ideas, but we, we don't see it in its full and so we have this apprehension about anything in the future. And when we do something different, that takes us from what we know into an area we do not know. New pastor comes into a church, begin to talk about change, and what does that say to the people in the church? So you're saying we did it wrong all along. No. But that's what it feels like, doesn't it? Or when we say change, we don't know what that's going to be. So we're a little apprehensive about it. Will I lose authority? Will I lose my standing? The Israelites went from being honored guests in Egypt in the days of Joseph to being held in severe captivity, brutalized if they could not meet production quotas on making bricks. So God set them free in the most miraculous of ways. And as soon as the going got just a little bit rough, they started griping and wanted to go back to their slavery in Egypt. Now that doesn't make sense. Here we stand, thousands of later, years later, we're reading this, and why would you want to go back to the brutal slavery? But it was what they knew. When faced with a desert, no food, snakes, whatever there might be. Yeah, my wife cringes too sometimes, wouldn't you? Like you did, Mary. But when faced with all of that, we have this fear of what's going on, and so they would rather be back their slavery and feet. One of, the, one of the things they said is, take us back to our pots full of food over the fire. All the leeks, garlics, and onions. Whew. No wonder they wandered around in the wilderness for 40 days, 40 years. They had to get the garlics, leeks, and onions out of their breath. Anyway, Joseph and all of his brothers, along with their father, had long since died by this time. Remember that 70 people had gone to Egypt to be with Joseph, but God led them out, uh, let them multiply over a 430-year period. So by the time they departed and went out into the wilderness, the numbers, they tell us, of fighting men, years 20 and older men were 603,000. So we anticipate that with women and children, the numbers were probably around 2.1 million, million people. Million dollars, that'd be all right too. Um, but million people. So what do we see in this? First, there's a huge influx of aliens into a nation in Egypt. 
So how did Pharaoh, Pharaoh choose to do with the problem of millions of Jews in the Egyptian nation and culture? Exodus chapter 1 verses 9 through 14 says, Look, he said to the people, the Israelites have become much too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them or they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, they will join our enemies. Fight against us and leave the country. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor. And they built Pithom and Ramses as store cities for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and worked them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with hard labor and brick and mortar. And with all kinds of work in the fields and all their hard labor, the Egyptians used them ruthlessly. Now, that took care of the people who were already there. But the Pharaoh went one step further for those that might be born, and that was to plan for the Israelites who were not there yet. Exodus chapter 1, verses 15 through 22. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shipra and Puah, when you help the Hebrew women in childbirth and observe them on the delivery stool, if it is a boy, kill him. But if it's a girl, let her live. Shipra and, and Pua were the two favorite ladies who oversaw the midwife profession. The story goes on that they didn't obey the Pharaoh. They choose to fear God and obey God, and they let the Hebrew boys live. And so because of that, God gave them families of their own. So then seeing that boys were born to the Israelites, Pharaoh made another decree. Every boy that is born to a Hebrew woman must be thrown into the Nile, but let every girl live. So in this passage, we see that the more the Israelites were oppressed and persecuted, the more God blessed them with growth. We see the same thing in the church throughout the centuries. The more oppressed and persecuted the church has become, the more the church has grown. One thing wrong with American churches, and I know, I hate to say this, we aren't persecuted enough. We are so comfortable. We don't have to do anything. Everything's given to us. It's when the, the Christian people and the people, the Israelites, were oppressed and persecuted and beaten, it's when they began to grow even more. The, the church has seen its largest and most vast growth during times of persecution and countries of persecution and oppression. The Chinese Christian church is largely underground. Millions and millions of followers that can't meet in public places, but it continues to grow. Why? Because the word of God is going out even though they're not legal. I mean, they could be killed. That brings us to a baby floating down the river. Pharaoh said, throw all the Hebrew boys in the river. Moses' mother did just that. She threw him in the river. Only what she did is she threw him in a basket to put him in the river. She made a basket. By the way, the meaning of the, the word for that basket was called ark. That was an ark design and all that similar to the ark that Noah built. It was a, a, a safe vessel to put in water to save people. And the purpose was to save Moses from the drowning of the river. Moses' mother made a basket of straw and made it uh, watertight with pitch, a tar-like substance, and took him to the river. She didn't cast him out aimlessly into the river to just float off down the river, but she carefully put him in the grass right by the river. <clears throat> Whether Moses' mother meant for him to be found by the Pharaoh's daughter or was simply trying to hide Moses, she placed him in the grass along the edge of the river just upstream from the Pharaoh's daughter. And while bathing in the river with her maidens, the Pharaoh's daughter saw the basket that contained Moses. Well, she didn't know it was Moses. But when Pharaoh's daughter got the baby, she felt compassion for the crying baby. 
Now all of this time, Moses' older sister Miriam was watching over her baby brother while she, he was hidden in the rushes. And when Pharaoh's daughter picked up the baby, she asked if she would like her to go get an Israelite mother to nurse him. And Pharaoh's daughter told Miriam to do so, and she went and got her own mother, the real mother of the baby. You know the story. This allowed her to take the baby home with her with full royal authority and nurse him until he was older and then she gave him back to the Pharaoh's daughter to be raised in the Pharaoh's household and that's when the daughter named him Moses that she had drawn him out. Moses was brought up as a prince and thoroughly trained in the religious, cultural and political ways of Egypt. He was afforded every luxury that one could expect from living in his royal family. Yet in the first recorded test of his character, we see that Moses came to the aid of his real family, the Israelites. When Moses saw one of the overseers severely beating a Hebrew slave, and when he saw that no one was looking, he killed the Egyptian and buried his body in the sand. The Pharaoh heard about this and was going to kill Moses. So Moses fled and went away to a place called Midian, where he met a man named Jethro, who was the local priest, and Jethro later became Moses' father long. He let Moses marry his daughter Zipporah. They had a son named Gershom, and it was during the years that Moses stayed in Midian that this Pharaoh died. And it was in this desert, after fleeing from Egypt, that Moses got married, raised a family, and spent 40 years tending flocks of sheep. Now, when we want God to do something, well, let me put it this way. I pray for patience. I just wish you'd hurry up and give it to me. Isn't that like we are? We like, we want to pray for something to happen and we expect it to happen right away. Moses has gone into the wilderness and it's 40 years while he was tending the flocks of sheep. So what, does, what comes next? The next thing that we see is that Moses was called by God. Have you ever been called by God to do a specific thing or at a specific time or in a specific way? Have you ever seemed to sense that, that unction from God that says, here's the thing you need to be doing? If you don't, you should be asking for it. But if you do, you know that you're never going to be satisfied until you do what God asks you to do. You know that there's a feeling that's different than anything else you've ever experienced and something that you'll never forget. While Moses was in the desert of Midian watching out over the flocks of sheep for his father-in-law Joseph, or excuse me, Jethro, he saw something he had never seen before. It was a bush that was on fire. Now, he'd probably seen bushes that were on fire before. But this one was different. This bush never even burned up. It just continued to be in flames. Now, that was unusual. So what would most of us do? We'd probably take one of those blankets that you see advertised on TV, and we'd go over there and throw it over the bush to try to put the fire out, right? Well, maybe not. But what did Moses do? It says that he went over to get a better look at this odd sight. It was sight. It was so peculiar, so strange that this bush didn't burn up. He wanted to know what on earth is going on. Why is this bush not burning up? And it was when he got near that the Lord spoke. And the Lord saw that he'd gone over to look. God called to him from the bush. He said, Moses, Moses. And Moses said, here I am. God said, don't come any closer. Take off your sandals. For the place where you are standing is holy ground. Then he said, I'm the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And at this time, when Moses heard this, he hid his face. Because he realized that he was in presence of the almighty God. And he was basically looking at him. He was afraid to look at the face of God. 
The Lord said, I've indeed seen the misery of my people in Egypt, and I've heard them crying out because of their slave masters, and I'm concerned about their suffering. So I've come down to rescue from them from the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land into a good and spacious land, a land flowing with milk and honey, the home of the Canaanite, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Hivites, and Jebusites. So now the cry of the Israelites has reached God, he says, and I have seen the way the Egyptians are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh. Remember what we said Pharaoh, the title means. The title Pharaoh means son of Ra, the God. So God says to Moses, I'm sending you to the other guy that thinks he's God, but he's not. And I want you to bring my people out of Egypt and out of slavery. There's a couple things in this passage I want to go over. First of all, God told Moses that he was standing on holy ground. Do you realize that is what we do every time we come into the presence of God, not just in the church, but anywhere we're in the presence of God. We are coming onto holy ground. Recently, some of us have walked through this church building and we have prayed in every room and in every doorway that God would make himself known in a real way in this place and that we take this ground as his and make it holy for his glory. We've also prayed that the evil one and his helpers would be stopped from entering this building. While everyone is welcome to come and worship and seek God in this place, we prayed that nothing of Satan would be allowed to enter into this building. And if Satan or his helpers somehow came in, that the Holy Spirit's presence in this place would kick him out. We've also been doing that in the city, praying that God will remove Satan's influence over the city and allow himself to reign. The thing that Satan hates to experience and hates to see are the prayers and praises of God's people being lifted up to an almighty God. You know that Satan's chief aim is to displace God as the ruler of the universe. And if he can get God's people to quit praying and praising, then Satan's winning. Now considering that, how many of us give any thought at all how precious and righteous this place is? How many of us envision that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob being in here is being in here right now? We're on holy ground right now. Still, as living temp temples of the living God, we are his holy ground. Wouldn't it be something... If we were so filled with the presence of Christ, the Holy Spirit of Christ, that when we are walking around the community, our very presence and, presence and essence would let people know that we are the temples of the living God. And they're on holy ground. Because we are holy ground. Man. Man. Can you just imagine it? Back to the story. As soon as Joseph became aware that the voice he heard was God's voice, he quickly fit his, hit his face because he was afraid to look upon the holy God of heaven. And know that each time we come into God's presence, we're coming into God's holy ground. Just as Moses hid his face, we must be sure that our hearts are worthy of standing in his sacred presence. The Israelites were in captivity in Egypt for over 400 years. Why did God wait until then to come to their rescue? He waited for two reasons. Remember I told you that the Pharaoh who was in power when Jacob came to Egypt had died and several after him and that the one who took power according to scripture didn't even know of Jacob and his sons. That's the time it went that's the time it went from bad to worse for the Israelites. It had gotten much worse and Pharaoh had would probably have killed the Israelites, but he needed them. So the first reason that God came when he did was to save his people. Jesus came 
what he did to save his people. The second reason he came when he did was because this was the first time it was recorded in all of scripture that God's people cried out to him in unison. He was waiting until his people were so down and so defeated that the only thing they could do is cry out in unison, Lord, help us. There are many parallels between the ancient Israelite nation and today's America as far as focusing on God is concerned. They focused on God at first and then when they had, were blessed and things got easy, they didn't need to focus as much on their daily survival. So they started focusing on their daily desires. They didn't focus on their needs, they focused on their wants and that is what hap has happened to us too. America is so fully, was fully focused on God in the beginning and things were not so easy. So we had to focus on staying alive and surviving. Then we got affluent and started having our, old, our needs met, all of them. So we started concentrating on what we wanted. The problem with that is when we focus on what we want, we're focusing on the worldly things we have around us. And when we focus on the world, we don't have time to focus on God. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. I truly believe that America is getting ready to suffer more than any of us are ready to endure. And I'm not trying to scare you, but give you a hope. What I'm trying to point, paint is what I believe an accurate picture for you. Things are going to get worse for the American people and even for Christians before it gets better, but it will get better. And when it gets as bad as it can possibly get, then I pray that American and the American church cries out to God and repents, repents and calls on him to save us. At that point, if Jesus hasn't come back already, I think God will come down and rescue those of us who are left. And he's giving us some time to come to him. In 2 Chronicles 7, 14, we, he tells uh, us who he, how, who he wants to hear from and how he wants to hear from us in this. Say this with me. Actually, you got to put an M in front of that Y on the second word. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. God has promised it many times over. And he promises it to us. If we will do four things for God, humble ourselves, pray, seek God's face, and repent, then God promised to do, promises to do three things for us. That is, hear our praise, forgive our sin, and heal our nation. Wouldn't it be awesome if God was able to heal our nation? And when we do today what the Israelites did then, God will rescue us like he did then, but he will let us suffer until we do those things. Back to our story. God is telling Moses that he is getting ready to take the Israelites home to the land they left 430 years earlier. One minute Moses was tending sheep in the desert, and the very next God had given him a calling for a very special job to be a deliverer. Most of us don't think we are spiritual enough or mature enough as Christians to be called for God. We can look at examples from Abram to, in the Old Testament to the Apostle Paul in the New Testament to see God does not call the qualified, but God qualifies the called. Make note of that. And what did Moses do, we look at verse 11, it says, But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites into Egypt? Moses did the same thing we do when God wants us to do something. First thing out of our mouths is to question God about who we are and what he thinks we're capable of doing. But we find that what God promised Moses, he also promised us. In verse 12, God says, I will be with you. 
New Testament says, I can do all things through him who gives me strength. See, if is God in, in us who accomplishes the things in life. It wasn't Moses who made the Pharaoh release the Israelites. It was God in Moses. It wasn't Moses who divided the Red Sea and drowned the Egyptian army. It was God in Moses. It wasn't Moses who provided the manna in the morning and the quails in the evening. It was God in Moses. Moses was humble at heart, and he knew that he could not do these things by himself. And God knew this, this too, so he promised to be with them. And none of us are strong enough to do anything for God by ourselves. So it's critical that we remember when God calls us, he stays with us to get through it. Moses wasn't too sure about this and he even asked God that he would say when, what he would say when people questioned him. So Moses did something for, or God did something for Moses that we normally does not do for anyone else. He tells Moses exactly how this is going to play out, step by step. He says he's gonna harden the Pharaoh's heart, but yet he's, they're gonna be released. And when God tells us to do something, we must wait until we've, we've done it to see what the results will be, but we also know that God is in it. Even after God gave Moses all the information, what did Moses do? Boy, I'm not sure. I don't speak very well. All right, I'm not sure I'm the one. What if they reject me? So God responded by telling him to throw the staff in his hand down onto the ground. And when he threw it onto the ground, it instantly became a snake. Then God told Moses to pick the snake up by the tail. And when he did, it turned back into a staff. Now most of us are saying, I can throw it down, that's fine. But let somebody else pick it up. Right? Right? God qualified the called. Moses wasn't qualified in and of himself. He was afraid and insecure. Have you ever felt that way? But God called Moses to be the Israelites' deliverer, and he calls us as well. Last week, we ended the message with this statement. God is looking for a few men and women to step forward to be called to lead the people of God out of slavery and of their sin. And we posted the question, how about you? Where are you being called to go? To whom are you being called to go? Seek that out. Spend some time in prayer. Doesn't matter how capable you are. Doesn't matter whether you think you can do it. God qualifies the called. He doesn't call the qualified. Moses was a murderer. King David was an adulterer. God called them. Doesn't matter how capable you are or aren't. What matters is if you're available to let God use you to bring about the best results for his kingdom and for his glory. We're going to be sharing in the Lord's Supper. And I want this to be a time as we talk with the kids that this is a thanksgiving for what God has done for us. But even more than that, we want to give a thanksgiving for what God is doing in us and through us. Are you with me? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we continue in this time of worship, and it is worship when we receive the Lord's Supper or even practice the Eucharist, the giving of thanks. Father, we thank you that you have done this for us, but more importantly, we thank you that you are doing it in us and through us. Father, we pray that we might be the body of Christ and the blood of Christ to reveal you to a world that desperately needs you. May we be that holy ground in Jesus' name.